The following podcast contains explicit language. Hello again, this is Paul Wilson with the Diesel Performance Podcast, and I'm very happy and excited to introduce a new co-host, Danny Voss. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely. Danny, uh, Danny's just started with Calibrated Power Solutions, seven years experience selling used diesel trucks here in the local area, Uh, sled puller, drag racer, aviator, he knows a little bit about diesel. So we thought it'd be a great time to bring him on. We're really excited to have you here, especially for what's going to be launching. It looks like Christmas week. Uh, Merry Christmas to everybody out there. Let's talk winter fuel. Absolutely. Let's get down to business. We're here in northern Illinois. Winter fuel is a big deal. Uh, I take phone calls on it every day at work. I talk to guys about it all throughout the winter season. Um, it, It just becomes a problem. You know, it seems like there's a lot of questions out there. We want to address some of those questions and provide some of our advice. Right, and do a lot of preventative things so you're not that guy calling in. (laughs) Isn't that the truth? So basically, we want to start at the beginning here of of why diesel fuel gels compared to gasoline. And and it's pretty simple. In diesel fuel, there's something called paraffin or wax. Um, As it gets colder, it becomes a solid. Okay, okay, so it's thicker crude oil. Um, that paraffin or that wax has what's called a cloud point. And that cloud point is basically when you can see cloudy wax crystals. So if you were to pour out diesel into a, a clear beaker or a clear, clear jar, cup, right? it would look cloudy as you look through it. And we all know diesel generally is very clear. You can see right through it. Right. So that's called the cloud point. Uh, there's those out there that have said you'll generally see a cloud point around negative 18 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, all the way up to plus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So it really depends on the specific mix from the pump. And I can personally vouch for that. I've been there. I've done that. <laughs> I uh, never was late for work. So don't be that guy being late for work because you don't know what's going on with your fuel. <laughs> but you have you have gelled up before and, and you had the truck stuck. I have, and that's not an excuse for your boss. So, you know, they're not going to take that excuse. I need to put filters on. You should have done that Sunday or Saturday when you were off work. (laughs) And I think that hits the nail on the head when we're talking preventative maintenance. And we'll we'll get into solutions as we go through the episode here. Um, Obviously, one of the biggest things up front we want to tell guys is a little bit of common sense is worth a whole lot when it comes to this stuff. It goes so far. I tell people life is tough, but it's even harder when you're stupid. (laughs) That's a great Joe DiMaggio quote. I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's so true. So so as we start to get into the cloud point, we, we find it in this wide range, and it depends on where you're at in the country, and it depends on a lot of other things. Most guys aren't going to go out in the morning and do a test sample of their tank to see if they have a cloud point. They're generally just going to notice a pour point. And, you know, the pour point, that's when, you know, the gel point is generally 10 to 15 degrees below the cloud point. And that's when you will gel. Absolutely. So so the cloud point is just when it looks cloudy. The pour point is when the fuel has actually become a solid or a portion of it has become a solid. And it's too late. <laughs> you're late for work. Your wife's mad that you're not home on time or whatever the case is, you're late. And that's it. You know, and that's usually it's funny because that is so much when we see it is we get calls early in the morning. Guys are stuck. They're freaking out. Or my favorite is, it started, I let it idle for five minutes, but it only let me get 20 feet down the road and died. Right on his face. Gelled. The guaranteed you're gelled. It's, there's no other problem with your truck. It's gelled. you got to warm it up. All of the fuel has to get warm. All of the filters have to thaw. Right. Not just a portion of your filter. You know, you want it to be all the way thawed. And it's tough. It's tough to tell sometimes. You know, I understand it. You got a, a large investment. You have a passion for your truck, you know, whether it's whatever brand or whatever year. Mm-hmm. I don't know a diesel owner who hates his truck. Yeah, absolutely true. <laughs> They're all pretty proud of what they bought. They're all uh, really responsive when you make fun of them. So they're really touchy about what they own and operate. And and that's it. And so that's why I think it's important. You know, I think that's why we all get into that immediate panic of, well, it drove down the road or I went out to go start it and it started yesterday. Why wouldn't it start today? And, and, And I think any customer, anybody out there would have that same immediate response. And that's what's awesome about this Duramax guys, Cummins guys, Power Strokes guys. We all have this in common. This is something that we can all listen to and hopefully take something from. You know, the Power Stroke guys have two filters, you know, to deal with. And Duramax guys, depending on how your setup is, you know, 
you got to be careful on what you're doing and make sure you're on top of your regular maintenance on top of doing the things you're supposed to preventative wise to not gel up. Um, I think before we jump in too far into the differences, let's hit types of fuel. Let's do that. Everybody knows, you know, there's two types of diesel fuels at the pump. You got number one and number two. But Paul, tell us the difference between number one and number two. So you're not putting the wrong fuel in your truck. Well, you know, number one's kerosene. I mean, that's really what it comes down to is number one, you're going to, you're going to run kerosene. That'll run the truck. It's really rare to find that in my area. Mine too. You don't see it unless you're at an older gas station, more of a mom and pops joint almost. Yeah. It's pretty rare around here. Yeah. And then number two is your, your standard diesel that, that's been treated. That's your regular diesel fuel. That's what 90% of the people I think listening are going to be running. Number two, you betcha. And as we get into that, we, we also started to find out there are different types of winterization. So pumps, where you're buying the fuel from, they have two different options of what they can do to the fuel in their tanks to make it worthwhile for you to buy. Right. Okay, so there's winter blend and winterized fuel. Now, what's the difference? Okay, so winter blend fuel is when the station themselves actually add kerosene to their number two. So they dilute their number two down with a little bit of kerosene. Mm -hmm. The challenge here is there's no specific guideline on exactly what they put in. And it's also, it's not like it's published at the pump. You, do, you don't know when you go to purchase it how much kerosene they put in. Correct. There are different reasons you wouldn't want to run pure kerosene or, or less kerosene the better, right? So you do need to dilute it down so that it raises those gel points, right? So it, it or I'm sorry, it would lower those gel points. So it needs to be even colder for it to gel. Uh, however, I don't know if I trust the guy running the gas station. Yeah, nothing against gas nothing station against owners. Them. I just, I wonder about their capacity to test. The, you know, are they just doing it off of anecdotal where it's, well, it worked for the last two guys, so why wouldn't it work for everybody? Mm-hmm. Or are they really measuring it down to the milliliter? There's not a lot of regulation on winter blend, and that's why I'm a big fan of winterized fuel. That's when the distributor or the people who actually own the fuel before it goes to the pump, they actually mix additives into it. It's very scientific. It's very well tested. It's very rigorous. It's, it's very documented. Right. They, I just feel like I have a little more trust in what they're going to provide me. I don't feel comfortable with kerosene in the newer diesels. You don't want to put high dollar parts at risk because you heard it was good on a forum. I I totally agree with that. And I think that's great advice. Um, You know, running, like I have guys who try to run alcohol or try to dilute it with a little bit of gas. Mm -hmm. I don't think they really understand about detonation points. Uh, When you're creating, when you're putting a fuel into something that detonates like a cylinder, and you change the impact or you change the amount of force or you change the amount of heat that's involved in that that cycle, there's a lot of unintended consequences that go along with that. It can be really hard on the injection system, on the pistons, yeah. on the rods, on pretty much the entire motor. Absolutely. Why take the risk? Again, most guys love their trucks. Right. Why do Don't you roll be, the dice on it. Yeah, you're not a guinea pig. You know? <laughs> this stuff, what, what um, Paul's talking about is if you want to play it safe, and I'm that type of guy, I'm going to always play it safe. I don't like to gamble like that, especially with something that's high dollar, you know, like a diesel truck. Right. And, you know, if you're going to do it, you might as well do what you know works, not what you heard works. I like that. I like that. That's a good way to phrase it. And so this also brings up guys with biodiesel. Um, biodiesel by itself is naturally more susceptible to gelling. So if you have converted your truck to a biodiesel rig, you need to be aware of all of the different components that that brings in because there's different types of biodiesel. Nowadays at my pump, even my number two contains up to 20% biodiesel, I've noticed. Yeah, up to. It's funny how they say up to. (laughs) They they really uh, cover their tail that way. It's cheaper to produce. Um, It's more available. There's a lot of seemingly benefits to it however i'm not a big fan i do like the newer trucks the newer trucks don't seem to respond real well to biodiesel it's thicker it gums things up more often there can be some problems if you don't do a full conversion so we don't recommend guys again just like the winter blend stuff we don't recommend you playing around with it or trying to do it at home so much um but again it you use additives to address this same as you do with regular diesel fuel you use just intelligent design you know you make sure you're prepared and I think that's a, a great transition to start to get in here. What are some of your options if you're trying to prevent gelling, if you're dealing with winter fuel? I mean, what I do personally, you know, first of all, everybody has to plug their truck in if it gets below. I always do it 20 degrees or below just because it's easier to start it. 
and it's um, a little easier to get warm to get up to temperature that way you're not starting from um, a lower temperature you, you're up you already give your chance of you give your truck a fighting chance to get up to temperature a little faster I know my neighbors appreciate it when I plug it in because they don't get that huge <laughs> cloud of pouring white diesel fuel. That's a wake-up call, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, the 60-year-old lady next door was really impressed first cold starts, let me tell you. Oh, really I, impressed. I bet. Just tell her to turn her hearing aid down a little and close <laughs> her blinds. But, you know, especially if you have a truck that goes in the elevated idle in the morning, you know, and you got an exhaust system, maybe run headers or whatever, down pipes, up pipes, all that good stuff. You know, definitely you're not going to impress your neighbors warming up in the morning. So if I like to start my truck and get out of my neighborhood so I don't ruin my relationships with my neighbors. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a big fan of about a 20-minute warm-up. That's just me. When I, st I go out 20 minutes before I'm ready to leave in the winter, I have the truck plugged in so it fires up quickly. It doesn't take 15 cranks and you, you know to get her to kick over. And it's the old 7.3. Yeah. Uh, so old trusty Rusty starts up every day like that. I let it warm up for 20 minutes. To be honest with you, uh, oil temperature comes up. And once oil temp comes up, you're done. There's really anything waiting to warm up beyond that is just comfort. Right. It's just the cab being warm. But you do want to let the viscosity of the oil thin out a little bit. And that is something that pretty much any time you start to research winter fuel, they'll tell you if it's extreme cold, if we have our Canadian listeners out there, uh, they actually tell you to go out and check the oil before you try cranking. And that if you pull the dipstick out, and I've never seen this because it's never been cold enough in northern Illinois for me to notice this, but... Be careful what you wish for. It <laughs> yeah, I said when it's 50 degrees out in Illinois, right? Um, but no, they, they said that if you pull the dipstick out and you're actually seeing that the oil is solid, obviously don't try to start the truck. And right. again, this is basic common sense. I think it's pretty extreme temperatures that that's happening. People don't realize it. They just get into... Um, a routine in the morning and they don't eat when it's cold out and it might have been nice the day before like today what is it like 45 50 degrees out yeah. in december now tomorrow we might wake up and you know it might be 20 degrees yeah so you know who knows maybe you didn't take those preventive measures before you know uh, you realize that the temperature is going to drop and, uh, and that's why you said 20 degrees I I'm terrible about checking the temperature even with an app on my phone i won't do it in the morning huh. i glance out the window if there's frost on the ground I know I'm going to be out there, and I'm going to let the truck warm up for 20 minutes. Again, even though it's 50 degrees here in Illinois, I am a creature of habit as well. However, I've tried to give myself a good habit. Even though it's this warm out, I still plug my truck in. Once December hits, and mm -hmm. if we get snow in November, I'll start early. But once the first snowfall hits, I plug in my truck every single night. Right. I just, like you said, I don't want to be stuck. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be a diesel guy who is stuck. It just bothers me. Yeah, absolutely. I had a guy that called in and you know he was telling me uh this was like two years ago at my place and he's telling me i'm gelled up i plugged in and everything well come to find out that his gfi was popped on the outside uh outside uh, outlet at his house <laughs> so what i like to do is you know get the lighted cords so you know you have power definitely when you plug in you, you know there's a connection there i like that absolutely i think that helps just a little bit yeah yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, like you said, every little bit you can do, mm -hmm. you know, puts you in the right direction. Uh, we have noticed guys who are really anal about this stuff never gel. Right. And so that's the question. How, how do those guys never gel and we have their next door neighbor stuck on the side of the road getting a ride? The more you know, the better off you are. The more um, preventive measures you will take because you know that is not the right way or you know it is the right way. Sure. Sure. And, and this is, we're talking a lot now about habit, but there are some right. aftermarket solutions that are out there as well. Um, obviously, if you're in your Dodge, you know, don't go to the shop and try to buy glow plugs for it. Well, Make sure your grid heater's working. You don't call AutoZone and ask for uh, number six glow plug on Cummins 5.9? <laughs> why, why not, Paul? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, but but no, but I mean, check, make sure your grid heater's working. You know, it's it's pretty basic. You can plug it in when it's still warm out before it gets freezing cold. Uh, you know, you, you can definitely tell a difference. You, you can feel the heat off of the block itself. Same thing with glow plugs. If you're pulling any glow plug codes on your uh, Duramax or on your power strokes, Go and fix the damn glow plugs. What are I don't they, know what people are waiting bucks, for. Thirty bucks a glow plug? It is. It is a pain in the ass job on a Duramax. Yeah. I don't know about a Power Stroke. I haven't had to do any. A lot of guys um, that do the glow plugs, they like to pull them out when the heads are warm, 
so they come out and they don't break off and you're pulling a broken glow plug out of the cylinder head which is a nightmare yes I hear you. Uh, so, yeah, so do some basic checks. Make sure that your basic factory equipment is working. It was designed to help the truck start in pretty extreme conditions. Use it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you're going aftermarket, we do have some aftermarket heaters for the filters out there. Uh, I know Fast makes one, although I'll be just perfectly honest, I'm not a huge fan of filter heaters that run electric. You know, when you run 12-volt electric, you know, even the lift pumps, they're 12 volts, you know, they can fail. Anything electronic can fail. They can fail. I guess my problem with them is that it's – I wonder if people realize these things don't run overnight. So you have to go out into your truck, turn the key to the on or the accessory position, Mm -hmm. and let it sit for 20 minutes. I assume at this point you're putting your battery on a charger. If I'm already going out there to plug in a battery charger, why didn't I just heat the truck the night before? Maybe maybe I have that lift pump and I didn't mount it in the right place, and this is something you and I have talked about before personally. Yeah. It matters where you mount the lift pump. It can. I get a lot of static because I have my. I drive a regular cab LBZ Duramax, and I have it hanging off the driver's side fuel rail, and it collects a lot of garbage from the road, a lot of slush, a lot of. It can accumulate a lot of ice. Yeah, yeah, they build up, and I, I've had guys in northern Michigan and Canada and things like that tuck them up underneath the frame rail. I've mm-hmm. had them build boxes around it to try to isolate it. You know, the the closer you can keep it in there, the more heat it should retain. Right, like a sheet metal case almost. It, exactly, exactly, and those guys they seem to do all right obviously the best case scenario is you have a garage yeah just roll it inside it is definitely a huge help but i let my wife park in the garage and i have my <laughs> other car in my other spot of the garage so i'm stuck outside so if you're that guy that can't make it into a garage you're not that fortunate or you have a wife that you love and you want to let her park in the uh, garage so she has a nice warm car when she starts uh, her day in the morning that's get great. a divorce yeah no i'm just kidding it's that's cheap, terrible cheaper cheaper to keep her i hear you hey, I'm, I hear a, I'm a newlywed so i can't be thinking that stuff there's no way that's hilarious um there are of course also additives and additives are something that danny and i have talked a lot about should you run them do they help how do you measure right we all seem to have personal preferences we posted this on our facebook page thank you very much uh derek uh, for getting on there, letting us know that you run TC three W two cycle oil. Yeah, not something I personally recommend. Although it it's your truck, I know Derek's truck. Um, helped him out with LBZ. He had uh, great guy. I'm sure it works for you, and I'm sure isolated incidences like that are okay. Right. I don't think that's what I would run. I, I run house myself. The gold bottle. It's it's a clear bottle. It's gold fluid. Right. I've never had a problem. I know Evan Schmidt out of Canada. Uh, my buddy with a Stell 64 on his LB7. I know that's what he does. Uh, he runs the house as well, and you're talking Canada, so it's yeah. it's not summer up there in, yeah. in January. It's a real deal. And a lot of big over-the-road truck drivers prefer house that you know that I've talked to in the past. P- me personally, I run the white bottle of power service in my truck. I run, uh, I just give it a couple little, look, look, you know, everybody's got their own little way to add. I don't ever measure. Nobody's going to sit there and measure out a Dixie cup or whatever at the pump, you know. You get that additive in there, and you get the fuel in there, and you get on the road. My challenge is that it says per tank, and, of course, I have dual tanks, so they're tiny. Mm-hmm. And then the same thing you're saying is I don't, I'm not measuring, so I'm doing, like, yeah, glug glug. Yeah. I guess is is the official diesel measurement of two, additive. Two glugs and you're good to go. <laughs> you know, having a thirty gallon tank, just use common sense. Yeah, yeah, and I, I that's what I was gonna say is my challenge I think is usually running the tank down low enough to where I feel like it makes sense to add additive. I don't if I already have a full tank and I I guess I have to burn that fuel off and get down to a low tank and then fill up and that's when I want to put my additive in. I usually don't add it if I'm only topping off the tank with a quarter tank or with you know with four or five gallons. Mm-hmm. I don't add it then. Right. I usually try to run myself down to about a quarter tank. I never let my truck sit under a quarter tank over the winter. Why, you don't trust your fuel gauge or what, Paul? Uh, no, I, I, I guess I trust the fuel gauge. The lower the volume of fluid, the faster it it gels, mm-hmm. right? Like if you took a Dixie cup and set it outside and you took a one-gallon bottle of water and set it outside – the Dixie cup will become ice first. Right. Same same, same concept. concept. Yeah. You, you know, so if you let the fuel get down under a quarter tank, you're kind of, again, you're asking for problems. You sure are. And nobody wants problems when they're on their way to start their day. <laughs> that is what I got to keep talking about because, you know, you're not making any money if you're late for work. I don't care what you do. Well, well, I guess it's one of those two, you know, I wonder 
have you ever bought windshield wipers when it was nice out? Yes. I, I never have. I'm that guy. Oh. Okay. I buy windshield wipers when it's pouring rain. I can't see three inches in front of me. <laughs> You're and that I need guy. them now. <laughs> you know, and then I'm standing out in the rain in front of AutoZone swapping out windshield wipers yep. while, you know, the fiance is screaming at me, let's let's get to where we're going. I wonder if our guys gelling up are doing that and I would just I'd love to help prevent it. Yeah. Maybe they're adding it after they're already gelled and there's additives for that, but they don't do the job like a preventative deal would. Yeah, let's talk about that. Diesel 911 has never worked for me. Several friends have. <laughs> yeah. Several friends I know yeah. have done it. I have an anecdotal experiences where one or two people have seen it work. Sure. Every time I've done it, I was SOL. I was stuck. From my understanding of 911, you know, I've never personally used it, but, you know, it's high in alcohol, and it's not something that's good to be running through your, your fuel system if you're just using that. Also, um, if you already if you're using 911, it's already too late. You already didn't do what you were supposed to. Now that's kind of like a band-aid to get you to where you're going, but it's still not enough. You know, that's something that I don't even think about. I don't even consider that product myself because I am considering doing the things that you're supposed to do to not even get to that point. And I'm I'm right there with you. Um, you know, like we talked about adding alcohol and things like that and gasoline higher detonation points so so it the combustion is larger than what it should be than what it's designed for to be in your motor uh I, preventive maintenance is so much easier now however i am that guy who's changing windshield wipers in the in the uh rainstorm and i am that guy who has gelled up before i used to drive a 03 kodiak with a flatbed with a huge 30 gallon tank that was just fully exposed to the elements and right. I didn't park it inside. I lived in an apartment then, so it parked on the street. Uh, it gelled up all the time. And I will say the diesel 911, man, if you want to drive on 911, you can. Like, it, it's a diesel. It's alcohol. It, it will work, but it's terrible for your truck. I, I hate to say it, man, but I've, I've been out there under the truck with a hair dryer. I have to. <laughs> I, you know, and, you know, if you live at home with your parents, which uh, some guys do that drive diesel trucks, that's why they're able to drive diesel trucks. Now you're still in your ma's hair dryer, your sister's hair dryer to go get your truck started. You're not going to impress them. Yeah. Yeah, it is It is an awkward sight to have to run an extension cord <laughs> out, out of the house and, you know, through the garage or whatever yeah. and get out to the truck and then be under there. And with a hair dryer, it's not not like an exact precision tool, right? And That's why it's made gun. for. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not a heat gun, right? <laughs> right? So so you're sitting there and just holding it and just holding it and, and you're hoping it's working. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's a long, drawn-out process. My experience has always been the, the best thing you can do to get a, a gelled up truck back on the road is get it inside. Get it inside, get a new filter. And, you know, I've taken a lot of fuel filters out of the housings that have been gelled. And you look at it and you're like, wow, look at that wax build up on the outside. And then, you know, you get that occasional guy that, like, you pull the filter and it's all red. And you're like, <laughs> hey, guy, what's going on here? You know, oh, you weren't supposed to see that, you know. <laughs> You know, that cracks me up, but I've seen, you know, I mean, they're paper filters typically. Right. You know, it's easy to gel up a paper filter. I mean, to do the filter replacement, have two sets on deck, you know, in your garage. Yeah. I, I keep a set in my toolbox. Yeah, I, I never understood that. Filters are not expensive. No. They're a fast change. And we're talking across the brands. It's pretty simple to at least have one backup in the truck with you. Right. I, I mean, personally, I'll have a backup in my truck and a backup in my toolbox. You know, I run, I don't run the factory fuel filter housing. I run just a, a lift pump with the water separator and um, the fuel filter. So I only have that one, you know, fuel filter theoretically right. to deal with. So, you know, me personally, I don't recommend removing your factory fuel filter. I feel that the more filtration, the better. But... You know, uh, at the time, I, I, I deleted it, and it's done. The damage is done. Yeah, you know, the only time I've ever recommended somebody to d delete the factory fuel filter is if the housing's leaking. Right. And then it's six to one, half a dozen to the other. You know, mm -hmm. do you want to rebuild it? Do you want to delete it? The kits are almost the same price. The labor is almost the exact same. Right. It's There's no real right or wrong way to go. I do totally agree with you. Um, I do still recommend to run the factory filter. And I've seen it where guys had um the wrong micron filter in their air dog or their fast pump and then um up in their factory fuel filter they have water 
So oh, yeah. it made it through the air dog or the fast pump whatever, or whatever you're running for a lift pump. Yeah, water naturally is found in diesel. So if there's condensation or large temperature changes, fuel will condensate. You you will get H2O, H2O to, to come together. Um, you will end up with water in there. So water, air water separator is always just a, a basic thing. You do have a whiff sensor in a Duramax, I believe in a power stroke as well. Um, pretty sure you have one in a, a Cummins, if I remember correctly. I know at least the common rails do. But it, it's one of those things that you don't think about, right? And There's it can one, make all the difference. Right. Cummins will have them, like you said. Um, a Duramax has them. You know, almost all the Duramaxes have them, unless you're like me and you deleted it. You know? <laughs> so, really, as we talk about winter fuel, I guess the biggest takeaway we could give you guys today is preventative maintenance. Right. Be prepared. It's like your finances. You know, if you let your finances get away from you, it's going to snowball into something bad. It's the same thing with your truck with anything with your health with your truck's health same thing with your fuel you got to stay on top of it the more you're on top of it the more you're aware of what's going on the less problems you're going to have and i think that's one of those big ones too you know as as we start to to really think about that even the guys out there you know who who have who don't have to drive the truck every day so if you've had the truck sit for a while and now you want to bring it out for for the winter you know if it's one of those type of trucks make sure you empty the tank and fill it with winterized diesel. It's pretty basic. Uh, make sure you're using a little bit of additive if that's something that you feel okay with. I'm definitely, like I said, a fan of the house. Danny's a fan of the, the power, power service. service. But I, I I run Standardine when I go to a pole or if I'm going to the drag strip or if I'm going to throw my truck on the dyno and try to get peak numbers. Like, if I'm competing against somebody, I'm going to run the most cetane I can. Makes sense. Right. And Standardine definitely is a little bit more costly than some of the other um, additives that are out there. But I got to tell you, I have never had a problem with clean filters and power service in the white bottle. Now, the silver bottle of power service is great in the summertime. It is a cetane boost, but it has no anti-gelling supplements in it. The anti-gelling supplements will be found in the white bottle of power service. Okay, so make sure you're getting the right stuff. Make right. sure you're putting it in at the appropriate time. Be prepared for winter and drive the trucks. Yeah, have fun with it. That's what they're intended for. You don't want to be that guy calling to work saying, I drive this big, bad truck, but I can't even make it to work. <laughs> That's embarrassing. You won't hear the end of it. <laughs> because it comes down to knowledge and what's going on with your truck. If you are gelling up, you know, it is embarrassing because usually it's user error. Right. It's the person's fault that owns and operates the vehicle. It's not the it's not the fuel. It's not the additive. It's not. It's, sometimes it's the filter. Okay, if you're plugged up, but that goes back to not changing it and keeping your regular maintenance up. That's right. I change my fuel filters. I I drive probably thirty to forty thousand miles a year, and I'm still changing my fuel filters religiously. You know. If before a poll, before a dyno event, you know, I'm doing it then. But, you know, I like to change it once a season. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like if I do that, then it doesn't get to the point where it's too late. I mean, the cost of four filters a year compared to one tow truck or one right. cab ride or one awkward situation, it's, Taking it's a, a no-brainer. Taking a vacation day at work, <laughs> not cool. It's definitely more beneficial to know what's going on so you don't get stuck in that trap. Excellent. Well, my name is Paul Wilson. I'm Danny Voss. Thank you very much for listening. The Diesel Performance Podcast is brought to you by Calibrated Power Solutions, home of DuramaxTuner.com, developer of performance engine and transmission calibrations for a wide variety of lake model diesel powertrains, including the Duramax, Cummins, John Deere, Jeep, and many more. For more information and the best customer service in the industry, Check out calibratedpower.com or call 815-568-7920.